So, uh, yes, yeah, so we have to get right to it, actually, because uh, now, I, now that I know your backgrounds, actually, I'll change up a little bit what we do. And I'm even open to uh, you know, interrupting and getting into discussion because there's so many avenues to cover. And the basic talk is one that's for, um, you know, all, all kinds of audiences. Uh, and you guys have got a lot more auto industry background than usual. So we'll delve into some topics in a little more detail. Now, because this talk is about uh, the, the grand changes that are coming from cars driving themselves, the computer and the car getting married. And that's the, uh, let me just switch my, my little remote control's not working, so I'll make it work. But let's cover a whole bunch of different changes to the world that happened because of that. But this is Moore's Law. How many of you, I'm sure you've heard this term of Moore's Law, this rule that's governed computing for 50 years, making computers get twice as good, twice as cheap every couple of years. So that's taken over many industries now, photography, music, you name, shopping, you name the industry, it's been turned upside down. It is the uh, transportation industry's turn for Moore's Law to come, and this is how it's going to come, by the computers becoming the most important part of the car and driving the car. Now, the, the real goal that started people on this was actually just the chance to save lives. You know, we human beings were not very good drivers. Every year around the world, we kill about 1.3 million people. It's absolutely astonishing number. Um, We'd be, you know, only the coronavirus is, is uh, likely to beat it in many years in terms of a cause of death in certain age ranges. Uh, in the United States, that number is about 40,000 people a year, which was worked out by the Transport Safety Agency there uh, to be about 870 billion US dollars for the cost of accidents, which is 29 cents a mile or 16 euro cents per kilometer, more than the cost of the benzene uh, in your vehicle for your cost of accidents than for your, uh, for your cost of fuel, which is astounding. Um, the uh, British numbers are actually, now I guess uh, even though this is Oxford group, uh, not too many of you are English, uh, but the British numbers are much better actually. The, uh, in Britain, about 40% uh, of the numbers in the United States in terms of fatalities and accidents and injuries per mile, so they do drive a little bit better there. If you want to get killed in Europe, I'll tell you which city you can go to. Um, th there they do, that is the most dangerous city in Europe as far as driving is concerned. Now, 40% of those fatalities involve alcohol, uh, which is something that immediately robots do not drink. And so um, you have a, a sort of an immediate benefit there. It's unlikely to happen. But here are some other amazing numbers. Uh, consider that in, this is, this is an American number, but it's, it's true in other cities around the world that about 60% of the land in some cities belongs to the car in one way or another, whether it's garages, driveways, parking lots, streets, and so on. Uh, really uh, amazing how much of our cities we've given over to the car and get the opportunity to change as this happens. I calculate that ground transportation uh, is about $5 trillion globally, so that makes it uh, probably the third largest industry in the world, and that's uh, all up for grabs, which is exciting. I've also calculated that this is for Americans, that they spend every year about 50 billion hours doing this. 50 billion hours. Put that in some context, the entire productive labor output of the United States is 240 billion hours. So we're looking at about a fifth of that. Um, added for moving steering wheels, something that we'll do less of as time goes on. This also results, again, these are American numbers, uh, in 8 billion tons of carbon dioxide being put out, about 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions, 25% of the energy of a large industrial countries going towards uh, burning gasoline and driving cars around. And here's a number that shocked me that I calculated. I, the whole human race, all together, every year we drive about 1.7 light years. Now, I don't know if any of you use light years in your work as a unit of human activity. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather staggering to think we're going faster than light if you were to add us all up together. Maybe we can get into Star Trek somehow. So. All of those numbers mean that everybody wants in, uh, all the car companies want in, the tier ones, uh, startups, everybody's trying to get in, and we'll go over some of them. Um, now, this is Daimler. Uh, they've been working on it for quite some time. Uh, actually, the German car company started out pretty well and, and put in some very large efforts, and recently they've actually scaled back their efforts significantly. And we'll probably talk about this, uh, the, the change in tone from major car OEMs, in, in particular the Germans, but also some of the others. I mean, the Americans haven't. Ford and GM are still going forward quite rapidly on this. 
Um, and uh, uh, Mario mentioned this particular car maker, Tesla. Now the most valuable car maker in the world with a market capitalization exceeding Toyota or Daimler, VW. Uh, in fact, more than uh, all the other American car companies combined, just staggeringly overvalued, frankly, even though it is a great car company. Uh, but one of the interesting things about this vehicle was that about four or five years ago, people who owned it woke up and got a little note on the screen in their car saying, your car will now um, do what it's called autopilot. It's not self-driving, but it'll keep itself in the road and you don't have to do anything, just have to watch it. Uh, and my car does this and, and, and various other cars do this. What was astounding though to car makers was this feature was just given to people free one morning when they woke up. I mean, uh, they've never had that experience in a car before. The car just gets a major new feature without doing anything uh, because of the approach that Tesla takes, which is to be as much a computer company as a car company. Um, there are efforts around Europe as well. These are vehicles that are running around in Britain. Um, this is actually the first company to actually sell a vehicle that does self-driving. It's a French company called Navia. Uh, these are their shuttles running around somewhere. These are low-speed devices which are able to, uh, uh, because they're low speed, they were able to get them out sooner. They still require a bit of human supervision though. Um, now, I mentioned Tesla, but uh, uh, in fact, I wrote an article about this yesterday. The Teslas, because people uh, do still have to supervise them, and some of them don't think they have to, and so they start looking away or playing games, sometimes result in terrible things. This is something that's not very far from where Mary and I live. Uh, this particular driver, unfortunately, lost his life because of a mistake that his car made and because he wasn't watching it. Uh, this is fascinating to me. This is a, a concept car from uh, BMW. Now, you know BMW, right? Their slogan for, uh, I don't know, for not for 100 years, but their slogan for a long time, Freude am Fahren. They call it uh, Joy of Driving in the United States. Uh, here's a, a car, and let's go over, and maybe you can see my mouse. Can, I don't know if you can, I know I haven't turned on my mouse, but if you look in the lower left side car, the left hand side of the car, they've put a bookshelf. All right? So that's not Freude am Fahren. Right. That's uh, uh, very, it's very interesting to see BMW think that way. Now, the truth is that for 100 years, they've built luxury performance cars. And so I don't think they can really change their DNA as quickly as one might like them to do or they need to do. But it's interesting to see them at least think about it. Another German automaker is trying to get in this game. But I think they may have a challenge saying to people, you know, trust your life to our software. Why would we ever lie to you? I mean, we're, uh, you know, we're not the sort who would do that. Um, and uh, the truth is that scandal actually may be the best thing to happen to them because it is forcing them to rethink their company. And the only way that big car companies will survive this is if they're ready to rethink. And so a VW may actually be the one who's forced to do that. Um, lots and lots of startups in the game. Some of them uh, with, uh, um, actually some of the icons have disappeared. Sorry for a little technical glitch here. Uh, but some of them with what are called unicorn valuations, which means to say, uh, that they've uh, been valued over a billion dollars or even received a billion dollars of investment. And one particular startup, uh, which we've been talking about a lot, uh, was one called Zooks. And you may not have known its name, even though it was the most funded of the startups that had received over a billion in investment and a $3 billion valuation. Because of the recent change in softening of thinking, Zooks uh, was not able to raise money during the coronavirus. And so they sold themselves a couple of weeks ago to Amazon. Uh, of course, this has uh, a lot of interesting complications, and we could do a whole hour on what this means. In fact, we just did with another group, uh, and I can point you to the video about it later. But Amazon is, uh, of course, a giant retailer, which has interest in automating their logistics and their retailing and their delivery. But they've said they actually want to pursue Zooks's vision, which was to build a completely reinvented, built-from-the-ground-up car that works as a robotic taxi service like Uber, but without drivers. Uh, and so Amazon says they want to do that. And so now we see the high-tech giants of the world, Amazon, uh, and as I'll show you a few others, uh, all trying to get into this game, which the car companies used to thought was it. Well, this, in fact, is Apple. Um, Apple... Um, is very secretive about their project. They don't really say what they're doing, but they're definitely in the game. Uh, they've had ups and downs. But I have learned one secret thing about the Apple car, which is it's only going to work if you get the new iPhone. So uh, that's uh, you know very very important. You know, people laugh at that. It's meant to be laughed at, but uh, Apple might actually try a, a gig like that. But Apple isn't telling us. They never tell people what they're doing. Another tech giant, heavily involved, although suffered a major setback that we'll talk about, is Uber. The reason this is a very important company is that many people believe that the right business for this is to build a ride service. Instead of selling cars, which is what the car industry has done for a century, you sell rides. 
And when you sell rides, you sell the entire value chain, the, the vehicle, of course, the insurance, the fuel, the maintenance, the dealer, every, every part of the automotive value chain is yours when you sell a ride. And Uber is already the number one brand in the world in selling rides, which gives them a, a nice leg up, which is why they have devoted a lot of effort into this. But they devoted it poorly. And as a result, uh, about two years ago now, um, they had the only fatal accident in the testing of these vehicles, where their vehicle uh, ran over a woman in Arizona because the human being supposed to supervise it was watching a video instead of doing her job. Um, and also because of flaws in the software, but the flaws are expected in prototypes. Uh, the real mistake came in the system of, that they had in order to make sure their testing was safe, and it wasn't. So that took them off the roads for, uh, well, they're back now, but only barely. So it took them off the roads for, only, for almost two years. It might have killed their whole project. And that also is worthy of another hour's discussion. Um, now, the other tech giant, which is the leader in almost everyone's view in this game, is uh, Google or Alphabet, now with a spin-off division called Waymo. And I know about this one. I worked on this car in its early years, um, and it's an amazing team with incredible results. Uh, they have driven, these are actually old numbers now, more than 20 million kilometers of real driving on real roads. Uh, they also do a lot of work in simulator, and they've gone tens of billions of virtual miles in simulator to test their vehicles in every situation that they can dream up. And most people will agree that they are well ahead of everybody else in this game. And in fact, uh, they actually have a service, uh, a prototype service running in uh, Phoenix, Arizona area as well, uh, where they've got about a thousand families allowed to use it. They don't open it to the general public yet. But um, some, but not all of the rides, the vehicle will show up with no one in it and you will get in and it will take you to another part of town uh, and, uh, and then you get out, uh, which is the service that everyone plans to offer. And they're the only ones actually uh, far enough along to, to offer it without a person in the vehicle. They're still supervised by a remote control center, uh, but they are, want to do that less and less over time until the vehicles become uh, able to operate without much human supervision and thus at a very low cost and provide a service which eventually becomes cheaper than owning a car yourself. Um, so think about this world of selling rides instead of cars. You pick up, it looks a lot like Uber. I'm sure you've all used Uber, Lyft, or any of these other companies. Um, you, you pick up your phone. You say you want to go somewhere. Something pulls up to take you there. Uh, you can do whatever you want while it does so. It doesn't take time out of your day turning steering wheels. Um, there isn't, uh, it's all done on the infrastructure we have now. We don't have to change the roads or anything else about our cities. It just happens. This is the potential world of the future. Now, that does four big things for us. It drives you around, of course, and if it's done well, well, if it, it won't be done unless it drives you more safely than people do today. But you also get the ability to deliver cars to you. Cars become this fungible cloud of ride service rather than what we think of them as today. Uh, the vehicles also refuel or recharge themselves, and they store or park themselves. And those last three, uh, while uh, not unthought of, but usually thought of behind just the idea of moving around, actually have big consequences for society and for cities and cars. One of the consequences is in the field of energy. And that's because today, when people buy cars, especially Americans, but it's true all over the world, people go into a car dealership and they say, what's the car that I want for the next five years, for the rest, you know, for, for my life. It's got to do all the things that I do with a car. And quite often they'll choose a vehicle like you see here, this Nissan um, SUV. In fact, in the United States, they buy more SUVs than they do sedans. Uh, that's not as true in Europe and other parts of the world. And I usually spend about two or three months a year in Europe. I'm afraid I'm not likely to do that this year, unfortunately. But uh, uh, anyway, they buy this. And of course, they ride around it. It can seat five people or often more, but they ride around with how many? Right, you know, just just one, um, and that's not tremendously efficient. So when you switch your question from what car do I need for my life to what car do I need today, you get a different answer. Uh, you're going to be alone. It's quite likely you might make sense to ride. Oh, I'm sort of blocking it, but you might ride in, in a, the kind of small vehicle that you see only a few of on the roads, but which are actually just the right choice for short trips across town, uh, but not the choice that people will buy as the car for their whole life. Now, when you do that, it becomes possible to make transportation very efficient, both in the roads and in the energy it uses. Also, in part, because electricity becomes the natural power source for fuel vehicles like this. Today, uh, I actually own an electric car, and I, I, like most people who've bought an electric car, I've discovered that all the fuss about charging them in range is much more fuss than there really is. It's actually not 
really that big a deal. But nonetheless, only about 1% of people have bought these vehicles today because they are afraid of that. Uh, but robots do not care about that. Robots don't care about anything being robots. Uh, they don't care about the convenience of charging or what they have to do or where they have to go. So you don't care about what's under the hood of a taxi when you, or the, sorry, the bonnet. We're going to be English, right? But you don't care what's under the bonnet of a taxi. And uh, so the fleet manager cares. The fleet manager spreadsheet cares about what the car looks like inside. And so when cars are in fleets and taxis, the economics are driven by fleet manager spreadsheets instead of the psychology of, of human beings. And the result is different types of cars being available, many more types, in fact, and a different fuel. So I think we're going to wean ourselves for many reasons off of gasoline. I think it's going to happen anyway because electric cars are actually pretty good. Uh, but it's going to happen even faster when people don't even care about the question of what fuel is there. I calculated, by the way, that this would stop the United States from having to import oil from overseas. You've probably noticed the Americans have this annoying habit of going to war over the oil they import. It would be nice to break them of that habit if we could pull that off, I think. So um, lots of amazing numbers. Let's talk a little bit about technology. We can go into that in more detail later if you like. Uh, at the front of this little vehicle that, uh, that, I, that you saw the big view of um, is a radar. So radar sees further than uh, um, other sensors. It sees through fog, which is very nice. Tells how fast things are going. Almost everyone uses that. And almost everyone but Elon Musk in Tesla uh, uses a sensor called LiDAR. LiDAR is a light radar of sorts, which gets a low resolution but accurate picture of how far away everything is in the world. Here's a little video of what it sees. And you can see it's not high resolution, but these little clouds of dots you see, if you see them well enough, you can tell they're trees and cars and all the other things on the road. But the high reliability of this has made people feel confident enough to put this technology on the road. And almost everybody uses a sensor of this sort. They initially cost a great deal of money. There's dozens and dozens of companies now working on making them cost about $200 so that they're not a big issue in the automotive price equation. But a, here is a, um, a point that I think is going to be particularly interesting to people working in the auto industry, which is to say that I think there are two cultural approaches that the various companies are taking. And if you look at the big car OEMs, like the two German logos I've placed on the top of this slide, um, they think of it as you might expect. They make, they make cars. They're very good at making cars. And they take their cars and they want to put computers and sensors on them and make them do new driving functions. But I think that the high-tech companies are playing this game by saying, we know all about computers, so let's take computers and put wheels on them and see what happens. Well, it's the same goal, but it's two very different styles of approach and, and two very different speeds of approach. Because um, if you've worked in the auto industry, as many of you have, you know that it's not the fastest innovating industry in the world. And there's a reason why Tesla has managed to shock the traditional industry and get the market cap that it has. Because it's definitely, it's in the middle between these two, actually. It's a car company and it's a high tech company, which is the, one of the reasons it's been successful. But when we see a battle for the soul of transportation, uh, my bet is on the, the high tech companies. And not everyone agrees with that, but that's the thing that I think will go. So I think we'll see, actually, I'm going to skip this because of time and talk to you about uh, how I think this changes what the most common vehicle of the future is. Because as I mentioned, it's described by fleet managers, which means that most vehicles are actually small for one to two people, because 80% of trips in cities are one person and just a short trip. And so if 80% of the trips are that, well then 80% of the vehicles should be, not quite 80%, but a lot of them. Uh, it's probably electric. It probably has only a few hundred parts. Now, if you contrast that with today's internal combustion cars, which have tens of thousands of parts, it's, it's actually amazing that they can sell me a car for you know $20,000, which is not a bad car uh, because of all the parts that go in it. Um, it will have few controls. It won't even have a dashboard necessarily. We're actually going to make a lot of these because there's going to be a lot of traveling in them and there's going to be lots of different types because you're going to get a different type depending on your trip if it's four of you who want to go skiing in the alps well then an suv is the vehicle you'd like to see summoned uh, but if it's just you going across town well then something like this toad i road that you see above my head uh, would be an excellent choice for that trip so this then predicts the winners and losers of the future automotive industry you know i should sit to the right here i think i've designed this so i sit to the right and then i don't block what you see behind me nearly as much, or I can, I can shrink myself a little bit if you prefer for some of these. Um, uh, where, where are we gone here? Oh, this, yeah. So, uh, so the sellers of rides win, the sellers of cars lose. The people who make components for the new cars and powertrains, which are electric, 
are the winners, the people who build the self-drive systems, the software, the sensors, and so on, and the fleet operators. And on the other side, I'm afraid, are the old world brands and the internal combustion engine. Also, other industries like dealers, uh, auto lenders, insurance underwriters, all of them who depend on the old model will see uh, problems as the world goes ahead. I don't know if we should do this, actually, because uh, I, I do want to have more time for discussion, but I'm going to take a temporary trip up there and tell you that this man, this is the man, it's Sebastian Thrun. Um, he's, uh, he's the guy who got me into self-driving. He's the guy who got a lot of people into self-driving. He was the head of the Google Car Project, and he also um, won the first big contest for building self-driving cars that really got everything going. And so great man, uh, and yet he's mostly given up on self-driving cars, and he believes the action's going to be in the sky. This is one of the vehicles that uh, his company has built, a vertical takeoff electric aircraft. So this is real. Uh, I know everyone said, where's my flying car? Well, it's actually happening. Um, these vehicles, from the engineering standpoint, are happening. The, uh, there are still a lot of non-engineering, well, there are some engineering problems to work out, and there are also non-engineering problems to work out. But it's a real thing that's happening. This is, um, here's a, uh, this is Airbus's uh, version of the same, uh, very similar to their design. Uh, the big companies like Boeing and Airbus are in this game, as well are small startups like the one built by Sebastian. Uh, this, uh, this is a vehicle I'm helping. It's an Israeli one that actually wants to be a true flying car with the wings folding up. I'm half and half about whether that's the right design or not. It has certain advantages. This is a Canadian company. Uh, and I'll... I'll let you watch it take off. So as you can see, it took off vertically like a drone, and now it's tilted forward so that its wings are horizontal and it can fly like a regular fixed wing aircraft and be efficient. So uh, yes, uh, about the text we see mentioned, there's a company called Ehang, which does one that's actually very much like a drone. Now this, these vehicles that I've shown you are not like drones in that they have wings, and that's actually very important because um, to be efficient, you do need to have wings. You cannot just fly on rotors. Uh, rotors are simpler and definitely easier to put together. And there's a couple of companies like Lilium uh, and, uh, which, and um, uh, Volocopter, uh, several European companies, American companies all doing this. In fact, there's about 300 companies trying to build this. Obviously, not all will succeed. Well, anyway, uh, there's a lot of room up in the sky. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, Sebastian claims that their vehicles use less energy than a Tesla to get you from A to B. Uh, so uh, when you have wings. So it's uh, some pretty remarkable capabilities there to talk about. Um, this also, by the way, uh, bodes big for transit. Now I'm going back to the ground for a minute here, and we're going to go under the ground in a second. Uh, but today, public transit is built on a philosophy, uh, because you need drivers of having big vehicles, buses and subways and so on. Uh, they go on fixed routes. They go on fixed schedules. They usually have a private right-of-way, at least the subways do, and they're run by the public, by the city. Tomorrow, I think transit will change a lot and be uh, smaller and medium vehicles, which bizarrely to most people turn out to be more efficient than big vehicles. Uh, that's quite counterintuitive. Uh, without drivers, without official routes, just ad hoc routes as people need them and on-demand schedules, and they'll use the same public streets rather than needing private ones, and they'll be both privately and publicly operated. Um, here's one vision of how it works where you have um, vans that are um, seat about 10 to 15 people, but are not much bigger than regular cars, and then single person pods, which gather people together for instantaneous transfer. That's the very important part. When it's all robots, you can coordinate unlike transit systems and make sure that when you get there, what you're trying to get into is already there, so you never wait. You just walk three feet and you make your transfer, and suddenly you've got the ability to produce public transit, which is still efficient and makes efficient use of the roads, but provides service almost matching the private cars that, of course, otherwise dominate the world. Um, and to get small, uh, I'm sure you've seen these scooters going around. I took this picture in Hamburg. Only the Germans uh, line up their scooters when they return them. Uh, you know, I, I don't think any other country does this happen. But um, the, uh, uh, these scooters are super efficient. Uh, if you want to compare the energy usage, uh, a typical subway, like the New York subway, which is the most efficient line in the United States, uses about 160 uh, watt hours per mile in this American unit, obviously, or British unit. 
to move people. And these scooters take about 18 watt hours per mile. So they're vastly more efficient than any other kind of transportation if you only need to go a mile or two. Uh, in order to solve the problems they have of not being lined up nicely by Germans, uh, uh, in fact, I've got a company that we're working on this. We're building a scooter that will drive itself to deliver itself to you or will to move from place to place and to go out to where it's going to be recharged. Uh, it doesn't drive you around. That would be kind of scary. Uh, so it just comes to your door and then uh, uh, magically it turns into the non-prototype and you get on it and ride away. Uh, and I, I don't know if I'll delve into some of the more futuristic things like uh, the, uh, the plan to build uh, evacuated tunnels where you can go at ridiculously high speeds. Uh, but actually tunneling is kind of interesting. This is Elon Musk again. Um, he uh, made some calculations and suggested to him that he could make tunneling a great deal cheaper than it is today. His main magic realization was that if you're digging a tunnel, a big round tunnel, uh, the amount of material you have to remove goes up with the square of the size of the tunnel. So if the tunnel is twice as wide, it takes four times as much to be dug out. And so he wants to build much smaller tunnels with, and he also wants to make his machine much better. So he wants to combine that quadratic rule with a, a lot of other innovation to make the tunneling machine cheaper, to make it be literally, you know, a hundredth of the price it is today to make tunnels, but not big tunnels for a train, small tunnels for little par cars and pods to go place to place. And he believes he can make tunneling so cheap that we can solve all of our street problems by going underground. Again, that's a little further out. But I wonder why these graphics are gone. But anyway, uh, I, I, I want to be cognizant of time. And just mentioned that I think there's a lot of big changes coming to cities because of the way they work. Uh, that's, uh, that's the old style of real estate in cities. I think the meaning of the structure of cities will change because we're going to change the meaning of distance. Everyone knows in, lo in real estate, the joke is the value is all location, location, location. And location and distance are highly connected with each other. And the reality is that um, every time we get a new transportation technology, we, we rewrite the city. The trolleys rewrote the city in the uh, 19th century. The car rewrote the city in the 20th century. And these new forms of transportation I'm talking about are going to rewrite the city and the nature of real estate and where we live and how we get to work and what we do in the 21st century. Part of it, of course, is what we're doing now, right? Not even traveling at all. Um, one sweet little benefit is that these robotic taxis, since they don't really park, they drop you off and they pick up someone else. Uh, it means we need a lot fewer parking lots. So all those parking lots we've got, we're going to get a little real estate bonanza. My hope is that we turn some of the parking lots into car parks. Uh, or sorry, yeah, the, yeah, and uh, sorry, the car parks into parks. I ruined my lovely joke. Uh, the uh, but anyway, we turn the car parks into parks. It's mostly going to be condo towers, I know, in some places, but uh, some of them will be parks, and that'll be nice to get from a real estate bonanza. Um, so let's skip over that. And then let's, uh, uh, let's also quickly cover the fact that I've been talking about moving people around. Uh, as we know, there's one product from Italy that around the world is the most valuable thing because no matter where you are and no matter when it is, you can get it in 30 minutes or less, right? Um, so there are people teams, this is one I work with in Estonia, who are building delivery robots, very small robots meant to move cargo, not people, which will get you anything in 30 minutes, not just a pizza. Right? So imagine if you can get anything in 30 minutes. You may not even need to own a lot of things if you can hire them uh, in just 30 minutes. These vehicles run on the pavements uh, rather than on the roads. There are other ones which are designed to run on the roads. And they are able to, um, we actually have them in production here. This is in Milton Keynes, a video I took last year, uh, just outside of London. Here's a woman at the co-op store. The robot's pulled up. She's put someone's order into the robot, uh, and it's going to scurry away. So this is good because it's going to be great to have very efficient delivery of everything when you want it, as soon as you want it. It's quite troublesome in other ways because retailing and restaurants are the core of what make many city neighborhoods interesting to be in and walk around. And they're going to suffer, not just because of this, but because of the move to online retail. So uh, yeah, here's our, here's our robot scurrying around. This is another vehicle built by friends of mine, which goes on the streets rather than on the pavements. And uh, it's bigger and can go a little bit faster, but because it has to go with other cars, it's a little harder problem for them to solve. Um, let's quickly go over a couple of the questions I mentioned. One of the first questions is why are the car OEMs pulling back. Now, there was a lot of very big excitement about this technology that began when Google first announced they were working on it. And everybody felt, oh, this is happening tomorrow. Uh, now, most companies did not announce dates, but the car companies all felt motivated to announce 2020 as the date that they would 
uh, have it ready because it seemed like a safe announcement. They did not succeed, obviously. Google uh, did put in a prototype service in 2019, which is roughly the date that they said they would do it. It was a year after that, but uh, it's still just an early prototype service. So many people have wondered, wait a minute, did we underestimate how hard this is? And of course we did a little bit. I mean, we always do. Uh, no one's ever done a software project. This is probably the most grand software project ever built by humans, in fact, and the fact that it would not come exactly on time is no surprise to anyone in the software industry. But nonetheless, for the car OEMs, this was actually, in a way, good news, because the last thing they wanted was to see their industry turned upside down by high-tech companies and startups and people who are not them. Uh, frankly, they'd rather their industry not be turned upside down at all. They'd rather it just continue the way that it always has and made them money. Uh, but in fact, it's going to be turned upside down, and they'd rather happen at their pace, not the pace of Silicon Valley companies. And so the idea to have a um, so OEM means original equipment manufacturer, and it's just a very short way that people uh, refer to uh, big companies, big car companies, we call them the OEMs. So that I mean the companies like BMW, you know, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Daimler and PSA and, and Ford and so on. Um, Anyway, so they've been pulling back because I think they'd be very happy to have it go at a slower speed. They're putting their focus now on driver assist products because they found their lunch is being eaten even sooner by companies like Tesla, which, among other things, offers very advanced driver assist technology in their car, which beats what they have to offer. So uh, they're doing that. Uh, the tech companies, though, are proceeding full speed. Uh, GM uh, is proceeding full speed with their cruise unit. It's a startup they bought to do self-driving. Ford uh, built a startup called Argo. I mean, they acquired a small one and... and pumped it up, uh, and they're proceeding full speed. So not everyone has retreated, but many of the large car companies and uh, tier ones, which are the big automotive suppliers, uh, have in fact retreated, and that's the reason why. There are still, of course, engineering problems and other problems to solve. Uh, the biggest one of all still, and has been for many years, is proving that you've done it, proving you've made it safe. Uh, making it safe is hard, but proving that it actually is safe is actually maybe even harder, similar like drugs, right? You can make a drug in a year, it takes 10 years to prove it's safe and put it on the market. And um, so this is the thing that everybody is trying to puzzle over. How can we prove to ourselves? Forget the governments. I mean, eventually you might have to prove it to governments or you will have to prove it to the public, but let's figure out that we can prove that it really is safe enough to bet our own lives on, bet customers' lives on and be out there and bet our company on. Because obviously if you do run over people, that's a bit of a a challenge no matter what regulations you have it's already illegal to run people over most people have discovered uh, in order to make this work the other big technological challenge is predicting what others are going to do on the road so I think they've gotten pretty good at most of the problems now but the one that still needs a lot of work is figuring out what the other people are going to do what human beings are still better at figuring out what think how human beings think and uh, is that guy about to cross the road uh, who's standing there on the side with his cell phone? Is that car going to change lanes in front of me? This is the sort, of sort of thing that human intuition is still better at than machines are, but uh, it's what they're working on. And also, everybody would like the sensing to work more quickly, uh, to detect things a little bit faster and be able to react more quickly. Now, the, the vehicles already have superhuman reaction times in many ways, but uh, even more superhuman would always be good. And the question everyone always asks me is when will this be there? And of course, the answer is June 23rd, 2022 at 4.44 p.m. Pacific time. No, there isn't a date, of course. Uh, what there is, is, uh, and the people who've named dates have always been a bit foolish, and usually it was because of pressure. Uh, the real answer is, it's when that first question gets answered. Have we proven it is safe? Once people prove it to their own lawyers and their own board of directors that they've made it safe, well, that is the day that the gold rush will begin. And everybody will be out there trying to claim territory and, and uh, being the leading robotic taxi service for the different cities of the world. So there's a whole raft of industries. And I'm going to actually not go over them because uh, there's so many. Uh, I'm going to go over them very quickly uh, because, um, I mean, it's industries you wouldn't expect. But transportation is so tired, like communications and the oil industry and the electric industry. And even the medical industry is affected by this. The food industry has big consequences. Retailing has consequences. A shipping gets consequences. Construction, all these things. And the cities themselves, they're all tied to transportation. And I really glossed over that for you. And I do apologize because I do want more time for questions. But we're going to see big changes to our life and our cities. We're going to see the potential to reduce billions of tons of carbon dioxide. We're going to see trillions of dollars up for grabs to be made, which gets everyone very excited. And as I mentioned at the start, 
the ability to save millions of lives. Well, those are immense numbers, and this is indeed a grand project, but people are working hard at, hard at it. They're going to succeed, and they're going to change the world. Thanks very much.